Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, happy Wednesday. Glad you're with us for the Three Martini Lunch. We are now less than a week away from actual voting, certainly in the Iowa caucuses and possibly on a uh, conviction or acquittal for President Trump, depending on how the witness vote goes uh, later this week. It's getting tense. It's getting weird. You know, Joe Biden telling people not to vote for him in Iowa yesterday. So, Jim, uh, <laughs> we're really getting into the home stretch here. You know, a lot of candidates make gaffes. When, when Joe Biden says to somebody, go vote for somebody else, you know, he just missed it by one. Vote for me or the other guy, either one. Oh, good times. If he's the nominee, there's going to be no shortage of material. I'll tell you that much right now. We are brought to you today by a new sponsor called Earnest. Right now, three martini lunch listeners can get a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash martini. Terms and conditions apply. We'll talk about that much later. So, uh, Jim, let's talk about the uh, Senate impeachment trial. A uh, lot of drama right now about whether there will be witnesses uh, over at Hot Air and some other places, you have headlines like Mitch McConnell doesn't have the votes to stop witnesses, but he will by Friday. So uh, I don't know what magic cocaine Mitch is working, but uh, he uh, <laughs> appears to know what buttons to push when he really needs to get what he wants to get. So we'll see how that works. But uh, whether John Bolton, Hunter Biden, both and, and more testify, we'll see. But today's official uh, good martini is that there's actually three Democrats according to Politico, who haven't made up their mind yet on uh, how they would vote on acquittal or conviction. They say uh, Democratic Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, and Doug Jones of Alabama are undecided on whether to vote to remove the president from office and agonizing over where to land. It's a decision that could have major ramifications for each senator's legacy and political prospects, as well as shape the broader political dynamics surrounding Impeachment heading into the 2020 elections. Uh, they say they're still undecided, and uh, Politico suggests they might, or at least some of them might, end up going the way of Democratic Congressman Jared Golden of Maine, who split his vote, voted guilty, or at least for the article of impeachment on abuse of power, but not on obstruction of Congress. So, uh, Jim, uh, we'll see what happens here. I, I had seen other reports about Diane Feinstein possibly hemming and hawing, but now she apparently is more into the conviction camp here, but uh, the only one here with real national ambitions is potentially Kirsten Cinema. If she were to vote not guilty on any of these, she'd be out of the running, I assume, for the, the VP slot. And uh, sounds like Doug Jones is at least still uh, contemplating trying to win this year. You know, Greg, uh, this is our good martini for the day, because about a little more than a week ago, I spoke to a Republican senator who was pretty darn pro-Trump. And this senator basically said the same thing. I said, you think there are any Democrats who are not so certain to vote for removal? And this senator mentioned all three of those. And I, that struck me at that time as being way too optimistic. Manchin, okay, yeah, he's, he's the Democrat most likely to deviate from the party line. Doug Jones, clearly the demographics of his state, the political balance there makes it a possibility. And Cinema just seemed, you know, on the one hand, she does seem pretty independent minded and, and willing to defy her party. But this would be really going out on a limb for her. Uh, and probably instantaneously make her a, a target of progressive forces uh, within the party and, and you know, people talking about primary challenges and, and all that stuff. I think it's interesting that you're seeing the same thing again. And I don't know who Politico's sources are, but I don't think it's the same as the Republican senator that, uh, that I talked to. So you look at that and you're like, OK, that's kind of interesting. Um, that probably it does mean that these senators are genuinely communicating a sense of uh, uncertainty and wavering in a sense of that they could come down either way. I still think it's unlikely that you get all three. I still think that Doug Jones would probably, will probably look at this and realize that no matter what happens in 2020, he's a goner. Roy Moore being the nominee in, in, for the Republicans last time around had a lot to do with him winning that election. Uh, last I checked, Sessions is actually leading the Republican primary polling pretty handily. Uh, Sessions gets the nomination. This is probably not that competitive a race when all is said and done. But that having been said, who knows? I and mean, maybe he does decide to go that way. Each Democrat that votes for acquittal then makes it tougher for the for Democrats who do vote for acquittal to argue Trump should have been impeached, but only partisan loyalty saved him. Republicans ignored the evidence. Republicans put party over country, yada, yada, yada. Um, the more Democrats who vote no, the tougher this gets. And I think also a split uh, acquittal probably is almost as useful uh, to Republicans moving forward. So we'll see what happens. Um, I, I don't, I still am not completely convinced that you get all three. I think 
I think the over under would be like you know one point five. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think Mansion's pretty likely. I think Doug Jones is iffy, and I'm I'm really surprised if Cinema goes there. But the fact that you keep hearing her name indicates this might really be in the in the stars for her, which uh, which would be pretty interesting. And again, I think a that would put the Democrats probably at forty four votes if my math is correct. They have forty seven. An impeachment effort that gets forty four votes would kind of be you know seen as one, and particularly presuming they lose no Republicans, uh, that would probably have to be seen as a pretty significant defeat for the uh, House impeachment managers. So, Jim, Kirsten Cinema is not up till 2024. So if she actually votes not guilty on either of these, can we conclude that she's actually burned the tutu? <laughs> yes. You know, uh, burn, tutu, burn. <laughs> uh, but the second thing is, you know what's kind of interesting? The, the, when 1998, 1999, it was seen as this huge deal. And, and there were obviously you know, politically charged and Republicans were convinced that Bill Clinton really had broken the law and it was time to hold him accountable and that the Democrats, this was going to stick to them for a long time. And of course, the Democrats believe Republicans had been on a mad witch hunt and, and you know, you know, consumed by partisan rage and all that stuff. And a funny thing happened. You could argue that impeachment was a factor in Al Gore's defeat, although I kind of think that you point out the other bigger factors were at work there. The impeachment of Bill Clinton was not actually this this event that had deep ramifications, election cycle after election cycle. You know, September 11th, 2001, all of a sudden that became the dominant issue in our politics. So it's very interesting. People believe, oh, impeachment is huge and the, the, the effects of this vote will be felt for a long time. Life and, and the events have this interesting way of twisting and turning. This may not be seen as this career defining vote by a lot of senators. But, uh, Greg, I guess the only way to know that is, you know, time will tell. The Iraq war vote seems to keep coming up, but uh, impeachment votes, not so much. But, uh, hey, let's talk about uh, getting your financial house in order. A little financial relief goes a long way, especially when it comes to student loans. And student loan refinancing with Earnest can help you pick a monthly payment that fits your budget so you can breathe easier again when it comes to making those payments and making the rest of your ends meet for your other responsibilities. So if you're paying still the same rate you did when you graduated, odds are you can reduce your monthly payment and save big. Even if you've refinanced before, with today's low rate environment, most people can save and oftentimes quite a bit by refinancing again. Earnest is the easiest way to refinance your student loans. It saves you time and money. Checking your new rate is fast and easy. To start, you just complete a few questions online. It only takes about two minutes, and you get a personalized rate estimate, all without affecting your credit score. If you qualify, Earnest offers customizable loan terms and no fees. You can even combine private and federal loans. Imagine having one single monthly payment with one low rate. Have you already refinanced a loan? No problem. You can still be eligible to lower your interest rate yet again. Plus, the internet, meaning people, the internet's not a person, the internet has not taken out any student loans, but people on the internet love earnest customer service. They are rated 9.4 out of 10 on Trustpilot, so you know you'll always get the support you need. So start saving today. Three Martini Lunch listeners get a $100 cash bonus when they refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash martini. That's a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash martini. Go to earnest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T dot com slash martini today. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Jim, we've known for a while, as we switch to our bad martini, that China is stealing our intellectual property hand over fist. What we didn't know as much until yesterday is that they're literally stealing our intellectuals, meaning our people. Uh, They're paying them, and some of them are now in big, big trouble legally here in the United States. The latest is a guy named Dr. Charles Lieber, uh, who led Harvard's chemistry department at one point. Uh, And now, according to Lexington Wicked, which you know is a local Massachusetts paper, uh, this is wicked news. Uh, according, According to a criminal complaint... Lieber failed to disclose that he was being paid a salary of up to $50,000 per month and up to $158,000 per year in living expenses by China's Thousand Talents Program and the Wuhan University of Technology. I don't know if that's the same Wuhan where all the flu is. Probably is. Federal investigators also determined that Lieber was awarded more than $1.5 million to establish a nanotechnology research lab at the Wuhan University of Technology. 
Simultaneously, Lieber was receiving U.S. grant funds from the Department of Defense and National Institutes of Health. He's charged with making false statements about his connections to China on National Institutes of Health grant applications, and those programs required him to disclose if he was working with any foreign power. And uh, this is critically important because what we're finding out is that this is not a one-off. There's a lot of different people that China's been paying off here, essentially getting the people it pays to get research grants based on U.S. tax dollars and then giving that information, that technology, those innovations to China. So you and I are paying for China to get smarter. Yeah, uh, it is bad on many levels. I guess the first thing we should point out, Greg, is that when we're talking about the Chinese government, we don't mean wicked in the Boston uh, context. <laughs> they are genuinely wicked people and a wicked institution. The thing that kind of jumps out about this on two levels, first of all, yes, this is, by the way, the same Wuhan, the region connected to the coronavirus. Oh, by the way, apparently there's a bioweapons research lab in Wuhan. No one's directly connected the coronavirus to this, but an unfortunate coincidence and a couple of people are starting to have, you know, Anyone who read Stephen King's uh, The Stand is starting to say, hmm, an escaped bioweapon, huh? But I think more, more seriously, so China has been doing this for a long time. China obviously is very interested in, in you know, what we kind of would consider corporate espionage, uh, particularly looking at the def- you know, defense and the industrial base of the United States, trying to get uh, obviously the military applications of our scientific advances, but also the, the non-scientific. They just want any kind of technological innovation or, or anything that we are on the verge of developing. They want to be plugged in there and be in a position to steal it. And one of the ways they've been able to do it is through academia, um, because there's a lot, unsurprisingly, American universities and colleges want money. And along comes the Chinese government saying, we'd like to create a Confucius Institute or various other special schools focusing on Chinese culture or Chinese uh, language, other, you know, other things like that. And by and large, these schools have been very eager to take the money and set them up and hire professors. And, oh, isn't this terrific? But, oh, by the way, this gives the Chinese government now all of a sudden an in with these universities. All of a sudden, now you're dependent on the Chinese government or institutions that are effectively controlled by the Chinese government um, to keep maintaining this thing. And, of course, they get to send over some of their scholars. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of people who are taking a lot of interest in your physics departments, your your, uh, technological development departments and all that kind of stuff. The other aspect that I think is really fat, first of all, this is Harvard University. This is allegedly the creme de la creme of, of the American a- academic institutions and scientific institutions. And the other thing that kind of jumps out about this, our, our good friend Yuval Levin has a new book coming out uh, about the loss of faith in American institutions. And you want to talk about this narrative that America has elites that feel no particular loyalty to the country itself, feel no particular loyalty to the countrymen who are most interested in getting rich and enriching themselves and leaving everybody behind and not having any particular ethics. You know, the sort of things that were kind of exposed in the big admissions scandal not that long ago, Greg. (laughs) Boy, this is another giant vivid case, right? I mean, the guy who basically was running the chemistry department was getting paid by China and lying to the U.S. Defense Department about it. This is about his big flashing neon sign. The elites don't care about you. The elites aren't looking out for you. The elites just want to get rich and they will work with evil to do it. Uh, I mean, the only upside you could say, Greg, is there's nothing connecting this guy to Jeffrey Epstein. Well, no, this is uh, this is the issue that uh, it, it seems to bubble right under the surface all the time. There always seems to be some flashpoint in American politics or elsewhere in foreign policy that constantly keeps China just under under the surface. This is uh, clearly one of the biggest threats we have. They're ruthless in dealing with our companies and our people who, again, engage with China because they want to get rich and they're willing to to uh, give up that technology in some cases or at least run the risk of having it stolen from them. It's an ugly thing, and uh, and unfortunately, we don't pay enough attention to it. But, yeah, uh, look, there's, this is a, a, there's a narrative that you can put together, citing evidence going back to the Clinton years, which Bill Clinton and quite a few congressional Republicans believe, you know, first we're going to extend most favored nation status to, uh, to China. Then we're going to extend permanent normal trade relationships with China. Uh, we all remember the Chinese fundraising from the 1996 Bill Clinton campaign. And we constantly were told, no, 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 don't worry. This is going to work out well for us. We're going to share our values with them. This is going to help spread human rights and respect and dignity of the Chinese people. And of course, as you and I discussed during the whole controversy around the NBA, no, it made us much more like them. Um, they have a lot more leverage over us than we have over them. And that's the opposite of what we were promised when these policies were put in place back in the 1990s. Well, here's now one more aspect in which clearly they don't respect our sovereignty. They don't respect 
our intellectual property. They don't respect, I mean, they basically look at every aspect of their interaction with us of how could this be exploited to our advantage? And the question really is, if this is the way China has treated us pretty much throughout the entirety of our engagement with them, why are we continuing to interact with them? Unless, of course, certain people are just getting enough money on the side to make it worthwhile. Let's uh, move to our crazy martini now, Jim. And, uh, you know, a lot of people speculating about who's going to win the Iowa caucuses next week. But, uh, hey, you can already start speculating about who's going to win the Iowa caucuses in 2024, because that's really what we want to talk about right now. There was one poll out uh, recently about who's leading the pack in 2024. And I basically just wanted to strangle whoever conducted the poll. But uh, not only are pollsters getting into this, uh, candidates are obviously jockeying for position as well, usually behind the scenes. But now Florida Senator Rick Scott, newly minted in the U.S. Senate, mind you, is already dipping his toe into uh, Iowa 2024, although he insists it is not about 2024. But Politico has the story. Uh, He is uh, engaging in ad buys, $19,000 worth of ad buys in Des Moines. His main messages are don't vote for Joe Biden and the impeachment trial is a total waste of time and it's a political sham. A GOP consultant, former director of the Republican Party of Florida named DJ Johnson says, uh, if you put 19 grand in Des Moines on TV, it's definitely Scott putting a toe in 2024. And if there's one thing we know about Scott after he puts a toe in, then comes the foot, then comes the whole leg. He's uh, put out a 30 second TV commercial and a two minute digital spot. Uh, This is a guy who has spent $150 million on three statewide races in Florida, two for governor and one for U.S. Senate. Uh, He spent $64 million to defeat Bill Nelson last year. And so, uh, Jim, you and I love the horse race. But looking ahead to an election when we haven't even started this one yet with actual votes is really exhausting. So what do you make of uh, Rick Scott getting out there, his uh, campaign saying... um, This is just him uh, getting out his message when everybody's paying attention. It has nothing to do with 2024. Greg and dear listeners, you're going to have to put up with a lot of throat clearing before (laughs) I get to my point here. Because I've interacted quite a bit with Rick Scott over the years. I think he was a very successful governor of Florida. Uh, In fact, I know some people who worked for him and who who were not down the line Republicans who said, boy, he really was a great manager, particularly during things like hurricanes. Um, He has all the skills you want in somebody who's got to deal with the crisis. Uh, I feel bad for all the times I said he looked like Lex Luthor trying to go after Superman. <laughs> um, I think he's deeply underrated. Uh, I, remember, I host, he always sends thank you notes whenever we're involved in some sort of joint event. I moderated some event he was speaking at, at the uh, Heritage Foundation. He made a reference to the villages. I said under my, um, audibly, but under my breath, ah, yes, God's waiting room. <laughs> and the poor governor did not blink at all. He did not react. He did not laugh. He did not scold. He simply, his face was frozen in no uh, discernible emotion whatsoever. So Senator Rick Scott, by and large, is a good guy. All of that having been said, I think this is a terrible development. And what it is, is that you know, basically this is Rick Scott using his copious personal fortune to run ads in Iowa saying, hey, Iowans, I really don't like Joe Biden. Don't vote for him. Which on the one hand, it's not unusual to see candidates endorsing candidates in their own party. It's not surprising that a Republican senator would believe that, you know, Democrats shouldn't or that, you know, people shouldn't vote uh, in the other party. I do think it's odd. I think it's a bad idea. We generally don't like it when one party tries to meddle in the other party's primaries. Uh, all the efforts that uh, the Democrats did to help promote Todd Akin uh, in the primary against uh, Claire McCaskill a couple of years back. This is kind of seen as dirty pool. I know Rush did Operation Chaos back in 2008 because he wanted to extend the Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama uh, primary. This stuff is kind of hard to do. I know Hugh Hewitt said he's voting for Sanders in the Virginia primary this year. One, I just feel as a general principle, it's not a good idea. We don't like it when they do it to us. We shouldn't do it to them. Parties should have the right to nominate who they want. I'm not even a huge fan of registered independents voting in states, or, you know, uh, like New Hampshire. But fine, that's what we've, what we've decided to do. Where this gets bad, and the other thing is also we've seen in this area, which you know, Mike Bloomberg, by the way, is now apparently in some polls now ahead of Buttigieg, Buttigieg, in uh, in certain national polling. He's done it entirely through television advertising. Tom Steyer qualified for these debates entirely through television advertising. If we're not entirely comfortable with the idea of our politics becoming dueling billionaires, running lots and lots of television ads to sway public opinion, we probably want to look at something like this and say, no, no, this is not a good idea. Stop it, Senator Scott. 
yes, you have every right to do it. It's the First Amendment. This is a bad, this is a guardrail. This is a, a norm. This, you know, it is just not a good, because the other thing is also like, again, Rick Scott's not running for president in 2020. He's not running the Democratic primary. Why is he running ads in Iowa telling people who to vote for in the caucus? Not even somebody in his own party. Um, I, I think this is a bad idea. I, first of all, I don't think it's going to be terribly effective unless this is some sort of like, I mean, Greg, do you think that this could be some sort of like ricochet reverse psychology thing in which Rick Scott really is more worried about Bernie Sanders? Like if, he ever, if we get the nomination and win, the country would take a huge shift to the left. So that maybe the better option is to go to Iowa Democrats, don't vote for Joe Biden. And they see the ad and say, I, that Rick Scott, how dare he tell me to vote for? Him? I'll show you, pal. I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> right. Again, I just don't think that parties should be meddling too much in the other side's so pr- primaries or caucuses. And uh, uh, also, if this, you know, this does appear to be fairly transparently. Hey, Iowa, <laughs> think of this as a teaser trailer for what's to come down the road. <laughs> Rick Scott 2024, now in production. Well, whether it's Joe or Bernie, uh, if they actually win, uh, he'd be running against an octogenarian. And so uh, the other thing is, uh, and it's pointed out in this article, is that if Rick Scott does run, there's a good chance that three Floridians will be running for the Republican nomination in 2024 because they figure Rubio will probably take another swing at it. And uh, if Ron DeSantis stays on the the course he's on as a very popular governor of Florida, uh, then he could uh, certainly be running in 2024 as well. So uh, Get ready for a, a, a big brawl among Florida people. Okay. I just want to observe, based on very recent history, Greg, you can ask Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush. <laughs> you can ask Tim Pawlenty and Michelle Bachman. You can, tell, you can ask Bitta O'Rourke and Julian Castro. It is very tough to run for president if somebody else from your state, who's also of, sim- of similar stature, is also running for president from the same state. If all three of these guys run, then they're probably all they're they're splitting the donor base. They're splitting the supporters. Uh, each one of them will need a win in their home state. They, they make life a heck of a lot complicated for each other. And oh, by the way, are you hearing this, Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz? <laughs> I know you're all buddies. Work it out. All right. Really, there's most of the time there's really only room for one candidate from one state. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's how it is. Now, that's an excellent point. Excellent point. We saw how it worked out for the New Yorkers in the Democratic field this year. They didn't even get to the actual ballot. So, Jim, very good. We'll see what goodness, badness, and craziness uh, surrounds us tomorrow. Uh, Q&A day today, so I'm sure it'll all be really down the line, impartial, really seeking facts type questions from both sides today. Not any sort of gotcha questions or uh, anything like that, right? Oh, I can't wait, Greg. <laughs> Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget our new sponsor. If you need help getting those costs down to pay off that student loan, you need to go to earnest.com slash martini. You'll get a much better rate. You'll breathe a lot easier, and you get a $100 cash bonus. Also, please subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a nice review, please. And we'll see you on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.